All right, guys, uh, welcome back. Uh, I hope you're getting through this very difficult time. I know I'm going absolutely nuts. I'm doing everything I can. I'm working 10 to 14 hours a day, and this has been utterly insane. Lots of things have happened, um, but we'll try to get through this. Uh, hopefully, uh, you learned something in the last chapter with uh, the beginning of news writing. I am getting... Uh, through the stuff that you've been giving me. I will get stuff back to you soon. Um, don't worry about that. Um, so now we have to... We've we learned how to do basic news writing, the pyramid. Now it's taking another uh, step in this process, getting a little more complicated, a little more sophisticated with writing styles. That's what this chapter is about. All right, so let's uh, kind of go through expanded news writing. All right, things we're going to learn in this lesson. Uh, basically, we're going to learn story structure, expanding on the pyramid, trying to find a few other ways to write a good news story, be a little more descriptive and a little deeper in our stories, and because not all your stories are going to be short and to the point. Some need some setup, some need some some reason for the people to care, and being able to describe things and write in a descriptive manner can set up those stories much better and give more sense to the brevity of a situation or why people should care. All right, next one is we're going to compare the inverted pyramid to the narrative and nonlinear styles. And nonlinear is a whole other way of uh, presenting news, and it's done in the uh, on a web-based format. And writing a narrative opening and using a uh, nut graph. And understanding using secondary senses to augment your approach. This is one of the big things I talked about when I'm asking you who to with those bonus questions are you paying attention to be a journalist you have to be able to use all your senses you have to be able to actually listen see what's going on around you hear things that's going on around you have an open eye uh, basically scan a situation see what's going on yes you're focused on the story but there's more to the story than just the facts or what people are saying. There is a feel to every story. And you have to hone all your senses. Um, you know, it, could, it could be smell. It could be sounds. It can be a feeling. There is always a feeling in a, any given situation. You have to be able to describe that. And that's what makes the really good stories. Being able to describe something in a way. And remember, you have to do it pretty briefly. So you have to be able to describe it nicely, um, so it creates a picture for your reader, but you can't get too long-winded with what you're writing. And hopefully this uh, th this lesson uh, gives you a little bit of uh, clarity on how to do that. Um, know that it's going to take a while to learn how to do this consistently, but you still have to get the, these first uh, lessons on uh, how to do it. It will come with, as with anything, it comes with time. All right, so now that we learned about the pyramid, we now have to learn how to break the rules of writing to bring a more expanded, a deeper story. Um, so here we've got, it's the expanded pyramid. Uh, you basically, you have your lead, um, your bridge, your background, and your body. And let me uh, kind of go into a little bit more detail. We talked about the lead, the five W's and the one H, and how you can get that lead and do it in a couple of sentences. Um, and also always remember FOCI, F-O-C-I-I, -I, the fame, oddity, conflict, immediacy, and impact. All those are aspects and topics that can help with uh, your lead and the different types of stories. And that the whole point is that is making sure your readers get a clear story as possible. All right, so now you've, you've written your lead, so we've gotten past the lead. All right, now we have to bridge it. You know, we, we, use, I, we use bridges uh, all the time, but um, in, in, in news, we actually, when you see uh, stand-up, if it's not at the end, 
it might be in the middle and we call it a stand-up bridge because it's segueing from one part of a story to another trying to connect from one part of a story to another that's what this bridge does um, there are a couple of different bridges uh, that you take in the writing of your stories now the first one is the lead cleanup bridge basically the lead cleanup bridge is a way to augment and help and include the aspects of the five W's and one H that might have not been included within the lead it this is where you would put that depending on what the uh, what the story is this is this this is a way to go from the lead to bridge to the other part of the story which is the background so if there is any that with the lead cleanup bridge if there's some aspect of the five W's and one H that you didn't get within the lead this is where you're putting this but that's in this specific case so oh no there's three different types of bridges and this is one type of bridge to use because remember every time you write it's going to be a different story it's going to be a different situation and one of these three types of bridges will help depending on how your lead went that's the big thing about that understand that um, the flexibility of writing yeah there's a formula but it's a flexible formula depending on how that lead of the story was written and every lead is going to be a little different so it's that's probably mo mo that's probably one of the most uh, important things to understand is when you're making the under making the decision on what bridge it all depends on what you did with the lead and it's flexibility you have formulas you have plans but you have to be flexible according to the way the story is being written out and your approach another different kind of bridge is the quote bridge it's simply just putting in a a, a quote that will smoothly transition from that lead to the next part of your background so you've given the whatever in the lead the who what when why where how however much you were able to uh, put in there in a good concise manner and then there's a quote that you find within the course of your in the course of your story or something that was said that can really once again bridge the gap between that lead into your background what's what's a good way to to transition from one point to another we, I do that been doing that all for a long long time in, in TV news uh, putting in sound bites that oh yeah this, this sound bites gonna really work well uh, and what they're saying here to introduce this po next part of the story uh, so that's and you it's the same with print you can do the same with print and when you use a quote bridge it's supposed to support the the lead that you've already written and the whatever the main aspects of that lead is that's the whole point of the quote bridge the next one is the advance to story bridge you might not have a great quote or that will bring you over to the next element into the background you might have actually been able to put in all the five w's and one h in your lead so you don't have a good quote you've you've done everything you were supposed to do with the lead so this is the other option uh, how the advance the story bridge um, so what you're going to do here you can start following the inverted per pyramid structure this is where you start getting deeper in the story this is where you this is where you're kind of starting into segueing into the background of of the story this is where we start putting in the you know a little bit of the meat and the potatoes basically whatever you think is the second most important aspect of this story this is where you put that then the next part is the background once you've gotten your lead and once you have your bridge to seg to transition over to the background that the background is where you're getting um, more information any information that you haven't put in here yet this is where you start putting some some context for your readers this is where you're getting uh, whatever other information that that's also important that people have to know about it supports everything it's like the proof um, it's giving you giving them information to better understand the story why it's important um, it could be people it could be events it could be any number of things background is a general statement 
and this this is where you put all that. Now it's you know it says you could get it done in maybe two sentences, could be three or four. Um, it all depends on the story. It depends on uh, what the story is, uh, how much background you have, how, what kind of job you've done up until that from the lead in the bridge. Uh, it's, and once again, I said as I said before, it's flexible, so you have to take that flexibly. Remember, this is a new story. You're not writing a big long thesis or paper. You have to keep it short. All right. That's why I said maybe three, maybe four sentences. One or, uh, one or two might actually do it. Remember, it's a news article. And then you go from the background to the body of the article. This is where you put your indirect quotes, your direct quotes. Remember, remember your indirect quotes are just paraphrased uh, quotes. Maybe they didn't give you wonderful words strung together, but you can take the basic ideas and those can, in some ways, set up your direct quotes. That happens a lot. You can set up a quote by teasing what is about to be said, but the important thing is is not to kill the quote. A lot of people kill the quote. Don't basically say the same thing leading into your quote. Do it in a way that teases it, but doesn't take away the heart of what that person is saying. People still do that. Professionals do that quite a bit, especially in television news industry. They do that about up. Uh, a lot of the time they basically kill the sound bite that's being brought in next by basically saying it in a way to set it up but repeating themselves so don't do that there's a way to write it so you're teasing it but not killing the sound bite that's coming up and you're giving them an idea of what about what is about to be said but you're not specifically saying that and you'd be surprised how many people actually do that and then we don't have a little graphic up here it's We've got the body, you've got your lead, your bridge, your background, your body. Now what you got to do is you got to end the story. How do I end the story? Uh, you want to wrap it up in a nice bow. You want to nail down the end of it. One of the uh, best ways I've found over the years is a, is a closing quote. Uh, it's just like, bang! I've, 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 I've nailed it with the end of this. It wraps everything up in a nice little package. Uh, it, and, it's, and part of that is how you interview people and we'll get deeper into interviewing later in the semester but how to interview people and sometimes like I said sometimes when you're interviewing you're trying to get information and sometimes you're interviewing for a way to ask a question in a way that you think you can get a good quote um, with a way to, to and one way to do that is to think about how am I going to end this piece now sometimes it just the the, the quote comes in a general answer that just happens to work but sometimes you can ask a question that you think might be a good way to wrap up a piece I mean but that's like I said be flexible be flexible and it can also give you more um, more to choose from when you're trying to sift through all your information and then oh if you don't have a good quote to end it all and you might not uh, there's there's a simple by doing a line or two. Uh, the 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 uh, the examples they gave as just a wrap up paragraph uh, to to wrap it up is simple too. A line like, uh, "Oh, the city council will vote on the matter May third. All money raised at the fair will benefit the Save the Children Fund." A popular one that we use when we're talking about a fire, and especially uh, for a fire is the the red cross is the red cross is helping all those displaced by the fire right? that was that was usually a go to all the time for the end of a uh, for the end of a story so it's it could be just one line a couple lines depends if you have a good quote depends if you don't if you don't then you can just go with a simple wrap it up and cuz you're looking for that finality to the story you're looking to end that story. Remember, it's been short, it's been brief, but you still do have to try to find some sort of finality to that. Um, there might be more chapters to it, and then in that case, uh, you, you hint in that way, but you do it in a way that still ends that story, and there may be another chapter coming up. We'll see. You know, it's, it, 
you know, something like, you know, something along those lines, um, that idea. But it still gives a finale to at least that story or at least what may be just a chapter in a story. You still want your beginning, your middle, and your end. Now, when dealing with this expanded news writing, the new style to bring more depth to the uh, to your stories, the, there are criticisms saying, oh, the inverted pyramid, it lacks flow, it sticks too close to the formula, it works for brief little stories. Um, so that's why we need to have another formula or something more to augment how to tell a story because not all stories are the same, some are deeper. Um, you can still use it. Um, you can still use the pyramid. You just have to tweak it a little bit with, uh, with these new steps and these new processes that I'm, I'm showing you here. Uh, you can still always go back to the pyramid. You might, so basically it's once again being flexible, being able to adapt. That's a, lot, uh, that's a lot of what life is, and that's a lot of what journalism is, because not every story is the same, and you're going to take different approaches different times depending on what's been presented to you, what you've found, uh, the situations, uh, the research, or the people. Um, it's, it's always different, and that's the biggest uh, thing I can tell you about when you're going out to get a story. It's always different, and you have to be able to adapt to the differences and know that you can't really use a cookie cutter approach every time. You can still use the same functions and use a lot of the rules, but you just have to tweak it a little bit here and there to best to do the best story you can. Now you gotta understand what big uh, mistake, especially when you first get started, is oh narrative writing. It's it's gonna be more creative. It lets me be loose and I don't have to necessarily follow the pyramid because the pyramid seems to constraining it's it's limiting my creativity no uh, it's not limiting your creativity and it's not easier uh, it, because you're, you still have the simple tr truth is is you still have to follow the rules of journalism you know who you're writing for of course your readers and following all the other rules when you're writing this story you still have to follow those specific rules. You can't go off the rails and think, "Oh, I'm just gonna. It's gonna be much better." And you still have your. You still have to be brief. You still have to be able to to communicate in, in a concise manner. In narrative writing, you're getting a chance to be more descriptive, and you're setting up scenes, and there's a little bit more to it than just facts important thing is not to get away from those those main tenets of journalism. As part of that uh, writing with the narrative feel, one of the best uh, examples of that is an opening segment from the movie Up. Um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with it, uh, with, with Carl and uh, the little boy that they run on an adventure, but at the beginning, um, he's an old man at that point, but they, they tell the story of Carl and Ellie and how, as they as children, they met. There's back and forth banter between them before they get to a certain section. Um, as children, telling how they how they met and setting up the scene for the rest of the story to know who Carl is and his life is. But the, with this interesting about interesting thing about this scene, they talk about as as being narrative is there weren't any words in that scene. It was all music and the scenes and the a action that was going on in there. Um, you could tell what was going on just by the reactions and the shots that you were seeing, but it basically summed up the entire relationship from when they first got married, started dating and got married, to when Ellie uh, passed away in, in old age and the struggles and them fighting and living life together. Uh, and basically showing you who Carl was um, up to that point in the story you're about to go into um, and the adventure he's about to take and all the meanings of how much it meant to him, the things in, in there he was fighting for, how much it meant to him, and you, it's, you saw why. What did this do? It set up why Carl thinks the way he did, why he's so passionate. You now know. And it was done with no words. It was done with music and visuals. And they did it in a pretty short period of time to set up the rest of that movie. 
If you want to see that, I have it on the content page. Uh, you can uh, watch the entire scene and it'll give you a good feel. So I, I, I recommend you watch that scene. You may have seen it before. Watch it again. Try to analyze it this time. All right. Now, one of the first things you have to do, and one of the ways you can do this is when you're writing a story, and it's going to be a more in-depth story, um, telling stories, the most effective way to do that is to have people who are experiencing that, that story. Uh, it's it's more than just a blurb in the news. You want to give a face to the impact of said news. You want to, why should people care about this news? Uh, well, what is the point of it? It's more than just, okay, this is this certain thing is happening. Uh, this is what why it's happening. Um, you want to put a face to it and why it's important and why people should care. And doing a descriptive opening does that. Why? Because you're bringing people into the story from a personal point of view. That's the most effective way to tell a story, is bringing people into that world, personalizing it, making people understand why this is important, making people understand what are the real world ramifications of what is going on. That's the best way to tell a story. And when you, you'll do lots of stories like this uh, in, in your careers when you're when you're writing, uh, is, is and that means going and hanging out with people and interviewing them and writing along with them and and really getting to know a day in the life of these people because that's what this is all about. That's the connection, people. You now stats people can be interested by those, but people aren't going to care about necessarily about stats. It's the effect it has on people, how it has on the community. And being able to tell a story through the, through the viewpoint of those people who are actually being affected does the best job. Basically, this is a scene setter. It sets up the rest of the article to talk about the more quote-unquote mundane points. But what do these mundane points mean to you, to me, uh, to the community in general? Uh, you know, it's that that's the whole point. Why should they care? That is the entire point. So when you're doing that, you, you're getting a real chance with a descriptive opening to be creative and set up the bigger picture, set up that said issue and problem, whatever the case may be. Now, what I did here, as you can see, I scanned in the example. This is a story about people who pick up roadkill off the road. Doesn't sound very exciting, um, but it, it has a point to what we're doing. It's a perfect example of what a descriptive opening is. And we, as you see here, we see Jimmy Williams, and he talks about he, how he's, uh, the, the reporter's talking about how he's sitting in the passenger seat. So that means that reporter is in the back of this, of this pickup truck, and basically describing what he or she is seeing. I mean, they go from what, what he's doing uh, to the hair, his cheeks, and giving a, a, a comparison of the appearance of a golden retriever enjoying a summer car ride. This is very descriptive. You know, and then this, this requires this requires that reporter to pay attention to really minute details. That's the thing about being a re reporter taking a look at what's going on, looking at these details. That's that's the hardest part. I mean, you have to do, like I told you, you have to do a whole bunch of different things. When you go on a deep story like this, you have to really pay attention to this. And they're talking about, he's even paying attention to the type of car, the type of truck, where what highway they're going in, down, um, and, and even twitches of, of heads and really paying attention. So this person's really paying attention to every little move that uh, this guy Jimmy is paying attention to, uh, every everything that this guy Jimmy is doing, even w what he says, and it's become almost like a, a, a novel in a way. In a way, it's kind of like a novel. And then even such things as noticing the road noise, Johnny Cash on the radio, and make sure it looks, it's a cassette player. So that gives it a little bit of, of more 
a little bit more. It's such detail. It's a truck, it's a cassette player, Johnny Cash. It's this. These are the things that you have to pay attention to when you're out there. And then we see a part here where um, we, have, we see some action and some very descriptive writing there. He swings out of the cab with triumphant enthusiasm. Because they, they 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 found something to get, basically they found a dead animal on the road. Doesn't seem all that exciting, but this is this is this person's job, and and talks about what it does. And he didn't say, okay, got the shovel. They with, with triumph enthusiasm. He grabs a square flathead shovel out of the rack attached to the pickup's bed and hustles his beefy frame toward the mound of fur and flies on the side of the highway. And then Gus goes into what what he says when he's there, and it's not a whole lot, but in the context of what you're doing there, it gives you the scene. It's describing the scene. This is a setup for a bigger story, talking about the cutting of said department. We haven't seen any of that information yet. This is all to set up, okay, these are the people being affected, and this is a day in the life of those people who do work in this department, what they go through during every day. So they're trying to set the scene as best as possible, and that requires you to be extraordinarily observant, paying attention to the most minute details so you can set up said scene. Because you're writing about it, you do not have a visual aid such as with video. You're doing it with your words, so that makes it even much more important. Now, here's a little uh, graphic of how to kind of go about dealing with that. There, what we just saw was an anecdote. I talked about the whole setup, and then we go to the hut graph, uh, or they, then we go to the nut graph. They call it a hut graph here. I don't know why. Um, it's from the same book. It's from the same thing. It doesn't really make much sense to me, but anyway. And then you got the meat. I told you the meat and potatoes, the real the meat of the story. And then you kind of go with another anecdote because it's a circle. Basically, it's a circle. You've got your scenario. This is Jimmy Williams. The hot graph, which we're going to get to, then starts to get into the issues of, of said roadkill agency. And then some more meat. And then you go back, what you do is you, you go back to the beginning. You go back to Jimmy. All right. Jimmy's the one who starts it off, and we come back to Jimmy at the end. He ends it because that's what it's about. Jimmy can't forget about Jimmy. Jimmy was the whole setup. Here's all the issue. Here's all the explanation in the middle. And then we go back to Jimmy because you can't forget about Jimmy. All right. That, that's how we, because you set it up with a descriptive. A, a descriptive opening, you're going to end it descriptively because he's the character who introduced everybody. You have to end with him in some way, shape, or form. Might only be a few lines, might not be all that long, but you have to get back to that original character uh, that you started off with. Okay, so we saw the descriptive. Now what we have here is what is a good nut graph example. We saw the whole descriptive opening of the uh, of this of this story and that's all been set now here is the nut graph all right williams and his driver a man who goes by the name scrunch so you've given a name to scrunch are the only roadkill removal team left in wabano county so there is so you're you're sh you know who these guys are but now they're the only ones left so where you're there's one there's the two people doing all this down from 10 crews just five years ago. So in that little bit, that one sentence, you're, you've been told who the other guy is, what his name is, and they're the only ones left. And they're left because they, there was 10 crews just five years ago. So it's down to nothing. Um, and they give you some information of how much ground these, this crew, remember, there's only two of them, two people uh, that, uh, 287 miles of highways, 543 miles of gravel roads for dead animals. Um, why and why should you care? In the hope of keeping the roads cleaner for residents and tourists alike. So this is why you should care. If you're not there, uh, if they're not there, then you're going to have uh, lots of lots and lots of uh, dead animals all over the place. 
Um, why is this? Now we're going to ask next, the next sentence goes into, however, repeated budget cuts now threaten to end the program altogether. Here's the issue. They're looking to cut budget. Oh, we'll get rid of the roadkill program. There's only one team left. There's two people to a total to cover all of this ground. And to end the program altogether, leaving an annual average of 243,812 animal corpses to dot the county's landscape. So you've now you've done all that other work. Now you've now you have a result, possible result of what could happen if the cut goes through and poor old Jimmy and Scrunch lose their job. Then there'll be nobody there to clean up. The, the the to clean up the uh, area, dead animals everywhere. You know it's also important. I was talking about it before. It's also very important to use all your senses. All right, sight, hearing, smells, uh, sounds, uh, um, also feelings. You go into any situation. I said this before, but go into any situation. There's a feeling in any given situation. It could be tense. It could be uh, cel celebratory, it could be sad, it could be uh, exciting, it could be scary. There's, there's always a feel to everything that you do and every story that you go on um, and when you, when, when you arrive there. And you have to be able to describe that in the written form. It's essential. Okay, now we just figured out how to best build your story. When going from the lead into the bridge and then into more of the background and now uh, we have to kind of build the body and how are you going to build the body of this article so basically what you have to do is there's a certain uh, mentality when doing this sometimes they uh, use subheadings or it helps with the kebab approach um, but lots of times you're not going to have the time or you're not going to have the length of something that it's going to transition smoothly from one part to the next. So you kind of go with the mentality of um, making sure, one, you have to, you need breaks. You need breaks in, the, in your text to transition to the next part of a story. Or you're just going to have one big, massive uh, monstrosity of text. And that is just going to scare anybody who's looking at this and reading this is like, I'm not going to deal with that. Um, so it's, that's, you have to remember the format that you're in. You have to remember how you're writing and what you're writing and who you're writing for. It's got to be quick and brief, and it can't look insurmountable. Now, when you're going to a story, you're going to start to find certain themes that pop up within the course of a story. You're going to basically narrow three or four of them, and you're going to discuss each of them in detail. There'll be different aspects or different opinions or different groups that might be affected uh, one way or another in this specific story. And then you're going to focus on them to, once again, just like we did with the, the descriptive opening, how this affects these groups of people. So once again, you're bringing impact, you're making people care about this story and the topics in this story and why it's important and who it's affecting, All right, And that's where you find those three or four themes and then you have three or four uh, paragraphs uh, to discuss each of them in, in detail to build up your story, to further even support your lead and the whole theme of that story so then you're you're finding three or four different aspects that give even more more bulk to your article and more substance this is a substance you know it's all about substance the book uh, came up with a, a suggestion of organic produce and dealing with lots of different groups and they talked about farmers and scientists and consumers health experts grocery store people anybody who might be involved with the agricultural industry and they gave a few possible basic storylines they say cost for producers versus consumers 
health benefits, concerns, and problems, opportunities for small and large farms. So there's a lot of different angles you can take, and that, that builds. It shows how many different parts of society this affects and the different aspects because it's not just produce, it's how it affects so many different people. And there's so many different stories to a topic and so many people are affected in different ways. And that's where you f is finding those. You have to find those people um, that are impacted by that. And these are the people who most work in with, in this case, produce. So that what you're going to do is you're going to build in chunks, all right? We gave you the different three or four themes. Now you're going to build in your chunks. But are going to break up the different interested parties, the different factors, the different people, whatever the instance is for that. And you're going to have build it in, in chunks. Another aspect you can use is chronologic wor approach can work sometimes. Won't work with every story, but that's what the chronological approach does. It's finding a few themes and in the example they had in the book they talk about an upcoming athlete and they can talk about the person's past how they came up uh, their career and maybe some success and then maybe some adversity that came and now we're back at the present day um, and this person is either doing well or not well whatever the case may be um, so that's following along the same approach well with that with the whole chunks idea all right now everything we've been talking about is linear storytelling we always think beginning middle end internet has changed the web has changed how we best tell a story because uh, it's just they decide what they want to they want what they want to look at what they want to like it says what they want to consume um, and it's and part of that you're still telling the story, still writing in an effective way, but you have to be briefer and you have to give the people out there more options. They, remember, it's the, it's the Internet, so it's very visual. It's more than just words. It could be videos. It could be graphics. It could be any number of things. It could be interactive games or something like that. So you're just trying to find a way to best tell the story in a variety of different ways using a variety of different medium for that feature within the context of the website and see how the user is going to decide what they want to choose to best inform them what works for them on their personal level so it's really tough on us as journalists to make sure we're not repeating things and so that makes it even more difficult uh, when you do have all these variety, this variety of different formats of media within the context of your page or a couple of web pages of, uh, for the web to best tell a story, to have be people best understand the, the issue or the, the concept, whatever the case may be in a variety of different ways as opposed to just the written word. And, if you're going to do this, you have to understand how to best do that in that format as well. Now we are coming to what is called visualizing the story web. Basically, this is understanding how the web user is navigating on their own. So this can is the way to best understand what you're going to be putting specifically in for that story. You know, and they used. Uh, parking on campus, something I know I can deal with and you all may have dealt with. Um, it's a popular uh, topic for people right now. Um, so it's, and you have to think about the, uh, these different aspects of that story. So how are we going to break it down? Well, you got parking on campus, okay? Uh, parking finance, how much does it cost? Parking fines, um, how, how much if you mess up, what, what, what happens? How much are you going to get charged? Um, and then you, how are we going to do that? Here, okay, we're going to have a chart of the parking pass costs. Okay, here we're going to have, uh, it's going to be a pro-con uh, chart. If we're going to do a chart, pro-con chart, passer, passes versus meters in comparison. And over here, here's a video uh, from the advice from parking patrol. Well, well, this is how they should do this. And then they have comparisons to other, other schools. Um, map of possible parking in around the campus, uh, 
rules for parking. So this goes from here to rules for parking. And then there's a graphic about the most unpaid tickets. So you're seeing how one is connected to another. It can be connected to another. Um, seeing how as it is, and it's a type of web, how one topic and another can affect another topic. And this is the best way to thinking of the best ways to report in a non-linear manner by using many different aspects and many different forms in a pick-as-you-choose way for your web user. Best way to do a non-linear in a non-linear way is have every one every item self-contained. Um, it's part of said story, but it's also got its own importance, its own prominence, its own aspect that puts itself out to help best tell the story. Then always have other options to that, if it's the video or the graph or whatever. Also have other links to the other aspects of the story. It could be going back to home or maybe there's another video, another graph. Um, basically giving people the options of, oh, where do I want to take this story next? This is a little more difficult than telling your typical story, but this is one of the many interesting uh, aspects that we have to deal with as journalists. The way to break it down, and the way to wait, and the way to break it down is short chunks again. You're gonna have short chunks because remember they are not gonna sit around for a long time. It's the web. There's a reason you have a lot of things going on, a lot of different pieces of. Of media to best tell that story. So when, when you do, do when you do write, it needs to be in short chunks. It needs to be brief and to the point because, especially in the nonlinear environment, people are making that choice and they're not going to want to sit and read all that deep into this big monstrosity of a of an article. You know, there's other things they may want to take part in. So you got you got to remember that. But of course, then with the small chunks, short chunks. You still go back to that pyramid. It always goes back to the pyramid. It's it's a shorter thing. Always remember the rules of the pyramid: the lead, the body, and then the the, the end. Okay, so remember, it still applies. It always goes back to the pyramid. All right, so you don't just throw out the rules. Once again, you got to go back to your original style because it's a professional journalistic approach. And these are the big three things that you should remember uh, about this chapter. Um, story should dictate your approach. Be flexible. Every story is different, okay? It's not all going to be the same. You're going to have different actors, different, different topics, different areas, different feels, different sounds. Yes, you still have your rules, but you still have to be flexible and, and still write within the context of said rules, all right? Whatever the best format for that story is, you use that. Remember, it's, everyone is different. You have to take it by a case-by-case case instance. When you do a descriptive opening, you have to take your time. You still have to be clear. You have to pay attention to everything that's going around you. Sights, sounds, smells, feels, every little minute detail. You write it down. You pick it up because that's what really gives the description. That's what gives the picture to the person reading, being able to perfectly set up on a scene with just your words is a very difficult thing to do and it takes time to do that so it don't be frustrated if you start having problems at first all right take your time with that description because you want to be on top of it make sure you are paying attention to absolutely everything that's another aspect of why I was telling you guys you have to be able to pay attention to what's going on around you uh, it's because most people are just ignoring it. They're very, they don't even realize what they're missing. Journalists pick up things because they have to because it becomes second nature. You might not be able to do it at first, but you will be able to after a while. And then give the story what it's worth. Give everything you have to that story. People keep saying, oh, you have the passion about it. Where do you think it comes from? You know, partially it is me, but this, this was perfect for what I do, you know, for, for, for this was a good industry for who I am. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be this big, long, war and peace diatribe, 700 pages, which you never have in a newspaper anyway, but whatever you do write, um, especially in a more complex story, 
encapsulate what you've found, find the theme, find the heart of that story, be able to communicate in a way through that article, through your writing, that you captured that moment. You captured the essence of this story with, and a lot of times, it's characters. Characters are what makes the story. We, why? Because we want the people who are reading our our stories to care about what's going on in there because of how it impacts them and how it impacts society. That's why we're here, okay? We're journalists. We're storytellers. You have to find the heart of that story and make sure you're able to properly communicate it out to your readers. All right, that's it. That's all I got for you this time. I'm going to do my best to get out the next one. I'll see you on the other side. All right, good luck. Stay safe and take care, all right?